Hi everyone, I'm in uh, Sag Harbor, New York. Beautiful day. And I'm standing right outside the, stand, the uh, American Hotel, which has become a very controversial place over the past week or so, but we'll come back to that. The interest for oil analysts in Sag Harbor is much more about the fact that this used, this town of about 2,500 people used to be the biggest, just about the biggest whaling port in the world. So quite extraordinary what they did in the late 1700s from this very place was that they would take a sailing ship, sail all the way around, down and back to the Pacific, grab a whale and come back sailing. And that took two years of a tough trip. And of course, ultimately the whales ran out um, at right at the time that you found a substitute, which was kerosene for the lamps and the market ended. The interest for us academically was always the way price dynamics happened at the end of the, oil, the whale oil age. Because rather than what you saw during the 2000s, which is people were arguing that you would run out of oil, which was already a bad argument, and then the oil price would go to $300 a barrel because we're so dependent on oil, it just simply wasn't supported by what you saw in the whale oil age, where the peak price was at the peak of the market. And as supply began to decline, the price didn't go higher and higher, it actually fell away. Which was very interesting because it kind of helped you think about everything. At the time in the 2000s when everyone was yelling about uh, peak oil supply, we knew what Hubbard had said. He was a shell geologist in the 50s that identified Hubbard's peak, which would be peak or, uh, the peak of the market comes halfway through the, recover the, the production of the ultimate recoverable reserve. The problem is you've got to know the ultimate recoverable reserves. And with technology over the last 10 years, pre-AI, but massive technology, which has been a feature of the oil industry since its beginnings, latest technology has always been employed and they are employing AI. Essentially what you've been able to do is, is, is change the ultimate recoverable reserve number. Guyana would be an example of an incremental supply node. High, um, horizontal drilling and fracking would be another. And so we haven't, we just have, we failed to, to ever hit a, a point of really believing that we're at halfway through ultimate recoverable reserve. And, you know, the evidence is there for all to see because the problem, as you all know, from talking, you know, at least listening to these videos, is there's way too much oil supply and we're heavily dependent on Saudi, particularly, and UAE, our, our important shifting dynamic with the UAE. Uh, we're very dependent on them indeed for. Um, holding the market together here, because if, if both of those were to go to maximum production, uh, you know, oil price would be below 60. But in the event, what's happened is because of market control on the supply side and Q3 and strong demand globally and everyone going to, to the beach like me, uh, we're actually looking at a good run in oil prices here um, and something of a good run in the equities as well, which is also being driven by an interesting rollover in Nvidia stock. And people have highlighted, and I think it's a great point, that the amount of money, in, and, and this is debatable because of the use of massive leverage, but the amount of money that's been sucked into the market by NVIDIA could well then rotate into other sectors. But of course, you'd need a stronger inflationary environment for it to ro rotate aggressively into oil. There's another issue, which is that the oil market is traded very much over the next two to three months. That's where all the liquidity in the future strip is. And really, I always think that a year out, two years out, five years out is just really a smear of, of the current situation. Uh, depending on you know how high or low the current tightness is, the market will tend to smear away from that into backwardation, unless we're in an extremely weak environment, which clearly we aren't because we're still backwardated with the price today higher than the futures price. I do find it interesting that oil is priced nominally on the futures strip, going down to let's say 60 over time. And yet I hear everyone wants to buy gold and Bitcoin and inflation hedges, but nobody talks about the future strip of oil being nominal. And therefore, you know, oil should in theory be as good an inflation play as, um, as a hard asset, especially as we kind of know where the reserves are, which is what we've been talking about. Uh, you know, oil should trade better if people were really buying it for inflation reasons. And in fact, you find the equities trade very tight on inflation, more so than the commodity, which is, you know, all stuff to think about. So that's all that. Let's take a stroll past the American Hotel and we'll talk about that to, to end this thing. Um, the other thing that I've been talking about, so basically what's happened here is that the oil equities haven't gone up as much as the oil price has, but the oil price has had a good couple of weeks. And the reason the equities don't go up as much is essentially because people are still concerned 
about the two to five year oversupply of oil, particularly 2025. So the one to two years of oversupply is a major concern. And, you know, the strength of non-OPEC growth combined with the jostling within OPEC to produce more oil led by UAE has really got the equity investors quite concerned. And I don't think any oil specialist is buying into this move in the oil equities uh, as much as generalists and rotation, because essentially we are all still concerned about the oversupply. It's uh, very hot, you'll see a strong summer. And as a result, you know, Q3, as we've said all along, should be pretty good. But our problem is that OPEC plans are for increased production as of Q4, which is when everything turns weak. So, you know, we're not really convinced by this move, but we're enjoying it. Um, so that's that. The only other thing to talk about is on Sunday, I was talking about global water. We started with the rather dramatic statement that gl climate change versus demography is essentially the ultimate mega theme. And that's what we're facing right now. So you've got tremendous demographic strength with, uh, with this climate change issue. And there's a number of manifestations of mega themes within that. One is water, which is what we talked about. Another is energy. Uh, you've got a food issue, which arguably is a subset of water and energy. And, um, you know, those, those are really three of the major things. And I'm blanking on the fourth that we have to worry about. Migrant demography. So migrants is the fourth. So those are the four things. Food, water, energy, and demography stroke migrants that we need to think about over the coming years. And as a result of that, we looked at water. Now, water is really representative of many of the issues we face today, basically because there's a global crisis. And the way I really bring this home to people is to say, do you know that London has a water crisis? And that also gives you a lot of the answer on, on water, which is that we're not short of water. Obviously, I can see a ton of water right over there. It's called the sea and you can desalinate. Additionally, water is essentially abundant, right? Think about it. So the problem isn't the water supply. The problem is the management of the water and the incredible waste because water has been abundant like electricity in the US. Now, electricity is still essentially managed by corporations. So there's, you know, some hope for a decent outcome in terms of how we manage, for example, the growth of AI demand. But in the case of water, it's very much a government undertaking and governments just do a shockingly bad job over time. So if you look at the ability to invest in water equities, there is no water resource play, right? As I said in my note, you need to join the government if you want to play with water. There is an ETF, the Invesco ETF, it's uh, PHO. And, you know, I went through the list of the companies in that, but essentially what you're forced to do is buy valve companies, pipe companies, man water management companies. There's quite a few of them, and some of them, like Danaher, have big market caps, you know, 50, 60 billion dollar market caps. But if you think about the importance of the fundamental, crucial importance of water, where arguably everything is a derivative, uh, you know, the ability to invest in water in the market is really quite limited, and, and that's sort of what we concluded. The oil water play, by the way, is Aris Water Solutions in the Permian, which, you know, looks kind of pricey, but ultimately can grow. There should be a lot of consolidation. And, um, you know, we do think that the water use in the Permian is going to be an ongoing theme because it will remain an absolutely crucial node of global oil production. And essentially, you're getting more and more water to manage and more and more wastewater to manage. And that should be a decent business for Aris, even if it trades quite rich. OK, so that's uh, all of that. I guess we should talk about um, Justin Timberlake. So up there is the American Hotel. The only thing I've really got to add is that I was over the road here buying a pair of swimming trunks for my son. And um, the guy said his first job in the surf shop, which is right opposite here, uh, first day of the job was only six, seven days ago. And th the night before the whole Justin Timberlake excitement had exploded, uh, or at least that day it was all over the media. And the first thing that happened on, on his first day in the surf shop is the phone rings and it's TMZ asking if they can buy the guy's videotape of the street outside. Only one problem with that, there's no cameras. All right, have a great week.